Music, like all the arts, depends for its effect on how our brains function. If we couldn't make sense of it, it would just seem random nonsense. So how do our brains understand music? This is a very complex question. But we know some of the answers from recent research, and they will provide us with a useful starting point for talking about harmony. In this course, we'll consider harmony exercises as little musical compositions. The key question then becomes how we judge them. For a professional musician, it's not enough to say that you like it or not. You need to be able to specify reasons. If we look at a few basic principles of music perception and musical form, they will give us the core criteria we need. Note that this lesson, unlike the others that follow, is not just one step in a cumulative progression. The principles we discuss here will be referred to repeatedly throughout the course, so you should return to these notions often as a basic reference. One basic function of the brain is detecting patterns in our environment. Evolution has selected human brains that can, at least in a limited way, predict danger. If I recognize the sounds a lion makes as it approaches, I'm more likely to be able to escape and therefore to survive. Detecting patterns implies making predictions. In the following musical example, by the third bar the pattern becomes obvious, and then I can predict the next bar before actually hearing it. Our pattern recognition capabilities also have the effect that when patterns go on too long, unchanged, we become habituated and pay less attention to them. We don't notice what's become normal. But if the pattern changes even slightly, it attracts attention again. Just a little change in the fourth bar here is enough to renew the listener's attention. In this case, the change prepares us for the cadence in the following bar, calling for attention right before a significant moment. Much of music's effect comes from creating expectations through patterns and then playing with them like this. David Guron's book, Sweet Anticipation, explores this subject in detail. An important part of a composer's job consists of inventing interesting patterns and then playing with them to create effects of emotional satisfaction and or partial frustration. Getting the balance between predictability and novelty just right is an important goal for a beginning composer. Harmony is one important area where we can work on this skill. As we saw above, music that's overly predictable quickly becomes boring. At a certain point, variety is necessary. Moments that introduce variety always stand out. Here's another example. Again, there's a surprise in measure four. The F sharp and the simultaneous change in the melodic pattern attract the listener's attention quite strongly. Roger Sessions' classic harmony treatise, Harmonic Practice, introduces the notion of harmonic accent. An accent is a kind of surprise. Harmonic accent can result from dissonance, modulation, or other aspects of the harmony that break with what we expect. Measure 4 above is a typical example of harmonic accent. One of the most common problems faced by a composer is deciding how much accent is needed at any given point. Often in student work, the amount of accent is inappropriate. There are two possible problems. We'll call them bumps and holes. A bump is a sudden accent which is too surprising. Here's an example. In the last bar here, the sudden appearance of two new accidentals and a very different kind of harmony, not based on thirds, as well as the breakdown of the sequence, all happen at the same time. These simultaneous surprises create an effect like a big bump in the road. Measure five stands out too much, breaking the musical flow. It sounds like a mistake. In the next example, we see the opposite problem. 
Somewhere around the fourth or fifth measure, we get bored since the pattern is relentlessly uniform. This creates what we will call a hole in the musical fabric. We've lost the listener's interest. Other kinds of holes include melodic lines that go in circles and prolonged static harmony. Bumps and holes are always in relation to context. A bump in one context could be a hole in another and could sound just right somewhere else. Context is really a set of norms. Some of them are cultural. We've learned these more or less unconsciously. But they're also the norms of the piece, established very quickly at the start of the music. Within a few moments, especially in a familiar style, listeners develop expectations about the voices and instruments being used the kind of harmony, familiar triadic harmony or not at the least, the register and the tempo and so on. Imagine hearing the first few bars of a Mozart piano sonata and the loud trombone note arriving suddenly. It just sounds wrong. That'd be a huge bump. What's interesting is that our sense of context is mainly unconscious. We deduce it with no particular effort as we track the environment around us. Context is established at various hierarchical levels, both local and global, as well as everything in between. In the cases we've looked at so far, for example, apart from the local norm, the pattern that's repeated in each bar, there's also a global norm of a diatonic scale and another relatively conjunct motion. Also, these examples are each presumably performed entirely on one instrument, in one tempo, with consistent articulation and so on. Substantial changes in any of these elements could create drastic discontinuity, potentially disrupting the whole. Since music is a temporal art, when something happens is often just as important as what is happening. Here are two versions of an example. Let's compare them. What sticks out here is the sudden change in the melodic motive in measure 4. In the next version, the change occurs in the last two bars. Which version is more convincing? Obviously the second one. Why? Because the anomaly, the change in motive, happens right before the cadence. It attracts our attention to a significant moment in the phrase, emphasizing the punctuation at the end. In the first version, the change of motive seems rather arbitrary, since it coordinates with nothing else in the phrase. Significant moments in a phrase normally fall into three categories. Endings, climaxes, and what we will call turning points places where the music moves off in a new direction. For composers, there's a general principle here. If you track the listener's attention with some kind of anomaly, it must quickly prove itself significant rather than arbitrary. Significant moments need to be followed up. Finding just the right moment for something special and getting just the right amount of accent are key skills in the craft of composition. Similarly, a performer needs to understand exactly how much emphasis a given moment requires in order to give an intelligent rendition of any piece. For example, a new accidental in producing a modulation might need to be stressed. Performers can use subtle changes in rubato, like retiming, to attract attention to a particular moment. Depending on the instrument, there are other kinds of possible emphasis, for example, varying the vibrato or making the crescendo on a wind or string instrument. A performer's sensitivity in musical form becomes apparent in these little decisions. For a theorist, developing even a rough scale of accent would be an interesting project. Composer was unconsciously judging degrees of novelty and accent all the time. Is it possible to discover objective criteria for these judgments? To sum up, patterns make music possible. Moments that emerge, that renew interest, create accents. Problems fall into two categories, bumps and holes. Mm -hmm.